Okay, I'm not going to lie. This right here is going to be a hard conversation to have, but it's a really important dialogue, so let's get into it. Let's talk about curfews. All right, so last week, uh, Baltimore City's Mayor Brandon Scott announced the summer curfew that will span from this weekend, Memorial Day through September 4th. That curfew calls for children under 14 to be indoors by 9 p.m. Children 17 and under must be indoors by 11 p.m. on weekends and 10 p.m. on weekdays. Officers will be focusing on youth crowds of 10 or more in public spaces in Baltimore. Parents will face fines up to $500. Children out after hours will be brought to one of two youth connection centers in the city. Now it's also supposed to only apply, it's also not supposed to apply to minors exercising their First Amendment rights, drivers on the highway, uh, leaving or going to a job in an emergency, out near the home or attending religious recreation or school activities with an adult. Now this curfew uh, was met with uh, a lot of the same mixed reviews and celebration and deep resentment from citizens in the city that largely differ according to racial and economic and even political lines. Uh, curfews are nothing new here in Baltimore. We were put on this consent decree in, uh, at, during the uprising of 2015 and several mayors came under scrutiny for instituting curfews during the summer and years prior and since. Uh, the politicians and police always promise to provide resources. They always say that the goal isn't to lock up, lock up our kids uh, with impunity, but somehow that's always exactly what ends up happening. Now, juvenile curfews are also not a new phenomenon in this country. They've been around for over 100 years. They skyrocketed in the mid-90s under the Clinton administration with their tough-on-crime policies that left many black communities in ruins and led to a lot of our kids being charged as adults and victimized by the same system of mass incarceration that still has a lot of our communities in a chokehold in 2023. Now, despite the fact that this whole super predator theory that the likes of Hillary Clinton and Princeton professor John DiUlio used to espouse back then during that time, uh, that turned out to be completely wrong and they had to walk that back. The idea of black kids being super predators that idea did stick within the, the American psyche and culture like Gorilla Glue. Juveniles are a politically powerless population in this country, so they make up for the easiest targets and scapegoats whenever it comes to addressing topics like violent crime. Usually they end up trapped into a court systems without guaranteed right to counsel and end up being victims of this system of mass incarceration that is pervasive in cities like Baltimore across the country. Um, they're often levied with fines that they can't pay, which end up setting their families back immeasurably during that time period. One of the main reasons that juvenile curfews are so deeply entrenched in our inner cities is the fact that propaganda and mythology around them has allowed them to last for so long, even though they obviously don't work. And this is not a radical statement. It's been studied and researched and proven with data time and time again for decades now, but... For some reason, we continue to do it every single year, expecting a different result. You know, Einstein's definition of insanity. But um, when it comes to curfews, we just can't seem to get enough of them. Contrary to popular belief, juveniles actually commit crimes at rates lower than adults in their 40s or 50s. So this idea that we need curfews in order to protect ourselves or them is a false premise to begin with. Yes, we have young people in our city that break laws and commit crimes, but they are not in any way representation of all of our city's youth as a whole. But they all end up getting criminalized just the same. Now, the list of reasons why curfews don't work is as long as the list of countless kids that get swallowed up in the system of mass incarceration every bloody summer in cities like Baltimore across America. But the idea behind curfews is that they would, keep, uh, they would keep troublemaking teens off the streets during the hottest months of the year, where violence is at its peak. It's believed by some that they are done to keep kids out of harm's way. But the deeper 
more unspoken reason has ties to a much deeper and darker history. Okay, so for those of you out there that may support this curfew or may think that it's necessary, right now I'm gonna outline a list of reasons why curfews have never had the desired effect that they sought to create in any of the major cities that they're implemented in. Even though they're so heavily relied on, like our infatuation with guns or policing. First, curfews criminalize non-criminal behavior while also increasing interactions between our youth and police. And even though we're saying this is supposed to be a situation where social workers will be doing a lion's share of the interactions between uh, themselves and the youth, this curfew will inevitably create more interactions between youth and police. And along with other punitive social uh, uh, figures that are involved in the process, that will have an adverse effect. Two, curfews draw our fringe youth even deeper into the criminal justice net because of their increased interaction with law enforcement. So the kids that are on the fringes, that are predisposed to certain behaviors, they're drawn deeper into that net of criminality just because of this increased police presence in our neighborhoods. Curfews are enforced and applied disproportionately against the least, pow the least powerful and most vulnerable social groups. Homeless youth, poor youth, unemployed youth, black youth, etc. This is something that always affects people in our communities more than it affects anybody else. Curfews increase an already pervasive pattern of juvenile crime victimization. They don't take family dynamics into account and it casts a wide net over all that fall under the age dem uh, demographic to be subjected to carceral intervention. So the kids that might have uh, certain proclivities where, you know, they might be a little bit rambunctious. They might not necessarily be on the fringes, but on that spectrum, they are much more likely to interact with law enforcement and have uh, some type of intervention take place due to this curfew. Curfews are based on the premise that our youth are a threat to the health and safety of the community. They require us seeing our kids as something to be feared. And it smacks of that super predator rhetoric from the 90s that still damages us today. Curfews are also negative and coercive. There are much more positive ways for us to provide opportunities for our youth to engage constructively in behaviors that uh, during their leisure time that will uplift them rather than just assigning curfews. Curfews also damage an already strained relationship between police officers and black kids of color. Some interactions and instances end up having blowback that ends up increasing juvenile victimization and overall crime. And most importantly, curfews also remove bystanders and witnesses from the streets, reducing their deterrent effects on street crime. And that's actually the, the, the most important one I think to discuss because I think it was Jane Jacobs that said on every street uh, on empty streets, there are no witnesses. Well populated streets are safe streets, deserted streets and bike crime. And that encapsulates so much of why this perspective of curfews making our streets safer is a lie. At the end of the day, you want streets that are full. You want youth to be present. You want youth to be out and free and in the open because at the end of the day, they contribute to the public safety. They contribute to being able to speak up if something Baltimore is Baltimore City, our summers are anxiously anticipated. Dwelling in a space between being feared and being sacred. Dirt bike street shows every day, fireworks every evening, fire hydrant swimming sessions in the afternoon heat, jump rope, double dutch, hopscotch on the curbside as the sun sets, lemon drops, snowballs, and water ice out on the block late at night with Baltimore Club bangers blasting from the speaker box. That's our vibe. That's our ritual. A curfew is designed not only to criminalize and police that, but also to remind our young people that they are to always know their place and who governs their existence. It's meant to show them how society really views them as predators too dangerous to be allowed out on the streets after dark. 
But as I said before, the data has never supported this theory, this myth, this false reality, this con. Juveniles don't need to be feared, they need to be loved. And that's far from the only reason why curfews don't. Evidence says that curfews don't have the desired impact on juvenile victimization rates that our policymakers say they do. As a matter of fact, many could say that the opposite effect is achieved. Rounding up all the kids that are out past curfew casts a very wide net. Tickets are issued to homeless youth, working youth, and youth who are homeschooled. The Campbell Collaboration published a systematic review on juvenile curfew programs in 2016. They examined over 7,000 studies of juvenile curfews. The report states, Evidence suggests that juvenile curfews are ineffective at reducing crime and victimization. The average effect on juvenile crime during curfew hours, with slightly positive, that's a slight e uh, increase in crime, and close to zero for crime during all hours. Similarly, juvenile victimization also appeared unaffected by the imposition of a curfew ordinance. A National Criminal Justice Reference uh, uh, Service Review in 2003 stated, Empirical studies of the impact of curfew laws fail to support the argument that curfews reduce crime and crime victimization. As I said before, man, this shit does not work. And Brandon also knows this. He grew up in Black Baltimore in the late 80s and the early 90s, right in the thick of the crack epidemic. So he knows what it was like. He had to traverse these streets himself when he was a child. He knows what it means because he wasn't one of those kids that grew up in a privileged bubble. He actually had to navigate these trenches for himself, evading the pitfalls of every block and experiencing police misconduct along the way, but still beating all the odds and statistics to grow up and make a success of him, out of himself. So he knows that this curfew will not yield all of the results that he says it will. But what does this curfew mean to a black kid from Baltimore? I think that's the more important question. And as somebody that actually for the past decade has worked in these trenches in these schools and now in my rec center over on the west side, I see kids every day that are examples of why we need to find another way. We need to find another way because the kids that I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis they're not respecting a curfew. I know kids that are 14 years old, but are the major breadwinners in their household. I know kids that take the bus to work shifts after they get done going to school every day that don't get back home until after 10 p.m. every night of the work week. I know single mothers with two or three kids home that work night shifts after day shifts just to put food on the table that they simply can't afford the luxury of changing their entire work schedules around just to make sure they're home every night to barricade their kids in the house during the summer months. And even though these cases aren't widely considered to be the norm, they are far too often unseen and overlooked. We shouldn't be creating blanket policies for the entire population of youth in Baltimore based on a perceived norm of privilege that many of our youth living on the fringes don't have equitable access to. I know families that can't make their next paycheck stretch long enough to cover their past due bills. And they'll also be incurring new fines and more debt from the city at different points in the summertime. Fines that might put their whole household back for months. And I actually know many young people that actually could benefit from some of the services that Mayor Scott is trying to offer here. But as long as those services are attached to the same punitive justice system that they've also learned through experience to rebel against, they'll respond with the same resistance that we've always known our babies to display. And we can't be mad at them for that. The truly insidious part about this curfew announcement is, and the sick irony is in the fact that like a hit of cocaine laced with fentanyl, the concession that Mayor Scott makes to the community of involving so, uh, social workers in his plan for rounding up our kids all summer, that's the true canary in the coal mine to this plan. Most of our kids have never been exposed to the therapy or the social work space. And if that by itself was the goal of this, uh, this city summer engagement, that would be an honorable thing. It would be 
a heavy but very necessary and worthwhile lift to make. But to partner these social workers on nightly patrols with the same police force that the youth rightfully see as their enemy, it's detrimental to their development and understanding of the mental health social work space in general. They'll begin to see those social workers as the same ops that they see in the police, which ultimately doesn't serve them or their development. The youth will be much more resistant and reluctant to accept any of these services that are being offered because of who it's coming from. And it truly seems like the mayor is trying to serve two masters right now. The black community that has nurtured and supported and uh, uh, protected him as he's grown up and became the man that we voted for, elected to represent us and the white bureaucrats that truly fund and move city affairs from behind the scenes, that always wanna answer spikes in crime with more policing, more curfews, and more punitive punishment, instead of solving the actual problems that are the root causes of the crime. The mayor seems to want to appear as tough on crime as his predecessors while still seeming connected to the black community who has organized against this same system for decades. But unfortunately, you can't do both. On this issue, you got to pick a side. And that's a hard thing for me to even say publicly because I, I'm, I make no apologies about it. I, I love our mayor. I've known him for over a decade now. And, you know, in many ways, we've kind of grown up in this public life, you know, uh, uh, knowing each other and having access to each other and supporting each other in all of our endeavors. And I know that he has a heart for improving the city, for doing the things necessary to fix it for the better. Uh, and it's tough being in this position as uh, a community figure, activist, educator, whatever you want to call it, because during times like this, even in spite of the fact that you may love somebody, you can still disagree. And I can't for the life of me find the, the, find the logic in this plan. I can't. And like I said, on this issue, you can't do both. You can't appear to be tough on crime and heal a city that's in pain. You can't fix a neighborhood's crime and its problems without investing in the people within that neighborhood. And to me, what, what makes the structure of this plan insidious is the fact that at face value, it seems like something that could work. It seems like something that you would want to believe in. Because we've been fighting for this social work presence in our interactions with law enforcement for years now from a community level, it's something that I personally advocated for to the mayor and to our police chief time and time again since our city's last uprising. And when this goes bad, as it surely will at some point, the presence of those social workers will be used as an example of why our ideas as a community really aren't sustainable or to be relied on. When if you gave us what we asked for in the first place without the unnecessary police presence, this actually could do some real good and impact lives of our kids that truly deserve it. Now, topics like this curfew signify a lot of age old visceral conversations about respectability politics in the black community. A lot of us are de facto responses, typically different variations of the parents need to do a better job parenting trope. That feeds into the problematic mindset that we need to wrangle another wild generation of useful misfits uh, running around tearing our city apart into submission with curfews and punitive punishment. But the youth aren't the ones tearing our city apart. We are. The apathetic citizens, the corrupt politicians, the bureaucrats, the lobbyists, the donors, the kingmakers, the average everyday citizens that don't see themselves as having any responsibility in the fight. We are all the real enemy, the real terrorists. We are the ones that are allowing those in power to keep our most poor and most vulnerable citizens on the fringes of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that we all deserve. The worst part about this curfew is it dehumanizes our kids by making us see them as things instead of people. 
we see them as more deserving of punitive justice than as deserving of resources and opportunity. And that opportunity won't be found at any of these youth connection centers that the city is touting. That's just the new baby bookings. It's just more of the same bullshit wrapped in a different brand and packaging and it all stinks like hell. What this conversation also does is take attention away from the more productive conversation to be had here. And that's what do we as a community do to truly address those youth who really are in need of engagement? Recently, uh, my lady's mother, her, uh, her car was uh, stolen. She got, uh, she got carjacked. And when the young man that stole her car was finally caught, uh, his family didn't have the $4,000 in damages that it cost to repair her vehicle. But she didn't want the kid sent to jail. She didn't want the family to be put in debt. What she wanted was reparation for the harm that was done to her. And our court system does a great many things to the black community, but one area where it falls shamefully short is in the area of restorative practices. What is to be done with the kids that society considers to be irredeemable? The thieves and the hustlers and the shooters and the gangbangers. What happens to them in this ghetto utopian fairy tale that we're discussing? Through my work in the community over the years, I've been blessed to know and work with some really amazing people. People that books should be written about. People that get up every single day and lay down their lives, their funds, their time, and their energy and their resources on the line for our youth. People like Uncle T over East. People like Elijah Miles and the Tendaya family. People like Erica Bridgeford and the Baltimore Ceasefire Movement and the Baltimore Community Mediation Center. People like Brittany Young and Baltimore B360. People like Neek, founder of Be More Than Dance. People like Saran of Aziza Peace. People like Lonnie of Joy Baltimore, people like Munir Rahar of CORE. Uh, these should be the people that we look to to task with the responsibility of reforming and restoring our youth because they're already out here doing it and they've been doing it for years. I don't think that we're paying enough attention to the fact that we're throwing a blanket around all the youth in Baltimore based on the behaviors of a very small minority. The majority of our kids here in Baltimore are not the problem, they're the solution. And they need our elders in the village to protect them. So get ready because our babies are really about to be out here on social media, TikTok, Twitter, and everything else playing in our faces all summer as a form of protest to this bullshit ordinance. And I, for one, I'm going to be here for every single second of it, protecting them, celebrating them all along the way. Because that same rebel spirit that drives them once lived inside me at that age. And I think that we all need to be able to remember that at some point, we were these kids. At some point, we needed an advocate. At some point, we needed love. We needed support. We needed a community. We needed a village. And to be quite honest with you, I don't want to be in a community where our youth aren't present and accounted for even at night. Without them, our streets are dark and dreary, absent of the energy that makes them come alive. Our youth provide the color and the vibrancy to our community that makes it feel like home. Our kids running around freely, uh, freely laughing, playing, just being themselves, always puts a smile on my face and puts my spirit at ease. Block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, they make Baltimore cool. They are the jazz. They are the seasoning. They are, they are our best remaining hope for a sustainable future. And we need to be nurturing them, not condemning them. They need our love, not our judgment. When they are well, we are well. And if we're going to be having this conversation about what it takes to properly address violent crime and vulnerability uh, of our black babies, we have to be willing to discuss tangible ways of giving them access to a level playing field, something that those of us in generations past never got a chance to have. It's going to take all of us getting involved and working together in order to make this possible. We can't afford to have anybody on the sidelines any longer. The only way out of this is if we do it together.